Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? The Telephone by Mary Treadgold Narrated by Tony Walker If you would catch the spleen and laugh yourself into stitches, follow me, I called to Sir Toby, and as I ran across the stage, caught the eye of the white-haired man in the VIP's row. The light from the stage streamed out over the darkened theatre. He was leaning forward, amused, laughing, and as Sir Toby chased after me, I laughed back. I had fallen in love with him at sight, there, from the middle of the stage of an end-of-term dramatic school performance of Twelfth Night. We met at the party after the show, and met again, and again, and then we began to meet in backstreet Soho restaurants, and then in my tiny London flat. I loved him desperately. I had never been in love before, and Alan had not been in love for over thirty years, not since he had married Catherine, he told me, in some queer little snowbound Canadian township. I never meant this to happen. I've never felt like this about any woman before. I don't understand myself, he said restlessly. All through that winter I clung to Alan. We kept the long secret winter afternoons and evenings together. There was so much that he wanted to give me, the things that I wanted for myself more than wanted. I believed I must have. I want to give you kindness and shelter and love, he said. He and Catherine had had no children, but it couldn't go on like that. Every time he came to my flat, the conflict in him deepened. It was like the deepening rift splitting a tree trunk down to its roots. He would turn wearily towards me. How can I hurt her? he would ask me. Catherine and I, we've been together all these years, long before you were even born. Why, I knew her when she was a schoolgirl, a child. Look at what we've done together. Look at our work. I tried to understand, but I seemed to see only a grey, ghostly marriage, a kind of deadly intellectual middle-aged companionship stretching back down the years. There was nothing there, I thought, that should be preserved. It would be so different for us, I thought, and I clung the more desperately. I, I can't live without you, I said, believing that I could not. Our dilemma. Alan's agony was resolved by Catherine finding out. There was no drama, no scenes. During the next few months I never knew what passed between them. I dared not ask. I felt like a child whose parents are gravely discussing in the next room portents beyond its comprehension. But presently Catherine went unobtrusively back to Canada without Alan. Alan shut up the house in Hampstead and talked of selling it. We, neither of us, wanted to live there. Immediately after our marriage, we came up to this cottage in the Western Highlands, which we rented through an advertisement in the Times. That year Scotland had one of its rare, perfect summers. We bathed and fished, and the long halcyon days passed over us with scarcely a break in the weather. I was blissfully happy. Free from the conflicts and indecisions of the past months, we turned again to each other, discovering new releases, a new and deepening absorption. Our cottage lay by the shore in a curve of the hills, and whenever I remember that summer, it seems as if the falling tides of the Atlantic were always in our ears, and as if the white sands were always warm under our bare feet. But again, it could not last. One scorching day in early September I came round the cottage at lunchtime carrying a pot roast over to the table under our rowan tree. I found Alan sitting, staring down at an open airmail letter that the postman had just delivered. He looked up as I put the pot roast down. His face was dazed and his hands were shaking. Catherine's dead, he said incredulously. 
dead. This letter's from her sister in Toronto. She says, and he stared again at the letter as though they were lying words. She says, heart failure. Very peacefully, she said. His eyes went past mine to the open sea. Then he got up and went into the house, while I, I stayed, plaiting the gingham cloth between my fingers. Once more I felt like the child who had inadvertently witnessed a parent's distress. Shocked, yes, but horribly embarrassed. Then I followed Alan into the cottage, and I put my arms round him. All that day I watched over him in my heart as he moved about the place, but we did not mention Catherine, nor the next day, and although I waited for Alan to speak, her name never passed our lips during the next three weeks. Three weeks later, to the day, among other letters forwarded from London by the post office, arrived the telephone bill for the Hampstead House, the second demand we had forgotten about the first. Damn, said Alan. We were once again eating our lunch in the garden. Damn, I ought to have had the thing disconnected before we ever left London. I picked up the envelope and looked at the date of the forwarding. They'll probably have cut you off themselves by now, I said. But Alan was already crossing the grass to collect the pudding from the kitchen oven. Go in by the hall, I called after him. You can find out if it's still connected by ringing the number. If you hear it ringing away at the London end, you'll know it's still on. And I lay back in my deck chair, staring up at the scarlet rowan berries against the sky, and thinking that Alan was beginning to hump his shoulders like an old man, and that his skin looked somehow as if the sea salt were drying it out. Well, I said, still connected. Perhaps I invented the slight pause before Alan carefully set down the apple pie, and replied, Yes, still connected. That evening... I went up to bed alone, because Alan said he wanted to trim the lamps in the kitchen. I was sitting in the window, in the late highland dusk, brushing my hair and looking out over the sea, when I heard a light tinkle in the hall below. I turned my head, but the house lay silent. I went over to the door. Hampstead 96843? Alan's voice, low, strained, came up the stairs. There was a long silence, and then my heart turned over, for I heard his voice again, whispering, Oh, my dear, my dear. But the words broke off, and from the dark well of the hall came a low sob. I suppose I moved, and the floorboard creaked, because I heard the receiver laid down, and I saw Alan's shadow move heavily across the wall at the foot of the stairs. We lay side by side that night, and we never spoke. But I know that it was before daybreak before Alan slept. During the next few days, I became terribly afraid. I began to watch over Alan with new eyes, those of a mother. For the first time I knew a quite different tenderness, one that nearly choked me with its burden of grief and fear for him as he moved about the cottage like a sleepwalker, trying pathetically to keep up appearances before me, his face, as it seemed, aging hourly in its weariness. I became frightened too, for myself. I kept telling myself that nothing, nothing had happened. But in the daytime, I avoided looking at the dead black telephone, inert, on its old-fashioned stand in the hall. At night, I lay awake, trying not to picture that telephone wire running tautly underground away from our cottage, running steadily south, straight down through the border hills, down through England. During that week, I tried never to leave Alan's side, but once I had to go off unexpectedly to the village shop. When I returned, I had to pretend that I hadn't seen him through the half-open door, gently laying down the receiver. And twice more in the evening, and there must have been other times, when I was cooking our supper, he slipped out of the kitchen, and I heard that faint, solitary tinkle in the hall. 
I could have rung up the telephone people and begged them to cut off the Hampstead number. But with what excuse? I could have taken pliers and wrenched our own telephone out of its socket. I knew that nothing would be solved with pliers. But by the weekend, I did know what I could try to do, for sanity's sake, to prevent us from going down into the solitudes of our guilt. On Friday afternoon, after tea, my opportunity came. It was a glorious evening, golden with the sand blowing lightly along the shore and a racing tide. I persuaded Alan to take the boat out to troll for mackerel on the turn. I watched him go off from the doorway. I waited until I actually saw him push the boat off from our small jetty. Then I turned back into the cottage and closed the door behind me. I had shut out all the evening sunlight so that I could hardly see the telephone, but I walked over to it. I took it up in both my hands. I drew a long, deep breath, and I gave the Hampstead number. All that I had been told of Catherine during those bad months in London had been of kindness and gentleness and goodness, nothing of revenge. To this I clung, and upon it I was banking. My teeth were chattering, and I was shaking all over when the bell down in London began to ring. I I suppose at that moment I lost my head. I thought I could have sworn. I heard the receiver, softly raised, at the far end. But I suppose I should have waited instead of bursting into words. Now I shall never know. And they were not even the words I'd planned. I suppose I'd reverted, being so frightened, to the kind of prayer one blurts out in childhood. Please, please, I said, down the mouthpiece, please let me have him now. I know everything I've done's been wrong. It's too late about that. But I won't be a child any more. I'll look after him, like you've always done, I said. Only, please let me have him now. I'll be a wife to him, I promise you, if that's what you're wanting. I can get him right again, and I'll take care of him, now and forevermore, I said. And I banged the receiver down and fled upstairs to our bedroom. Through the window I could see the little boat bobbing about on the sea. I sat down in the window in the full evening sun, and I shook all over, and I cried and cried. In the small hours of the morning came the crisis. I woke, it must have been about half past four. The bed was empty. In an instant I was wide awake because down in the hall I could hear the insistent tinkle of the telephone receiver struck over and over again and above it, mingled with it, Alan's voice. Somehow I got the lamp lighted The shadows tilted all over the ceiling, and I could hear the paraffin sloshing round the bowl as I stumbled out to the head of the stairs. Catherine! Catherine! He was shaking the receiver and babbling down the mouthpiece when my light from the staircase fell upon him. He let the receiver drop and stood, looking up at me. I can't get her, he said. I wanted her to forgive me, but she doesn't answer. I I can't reach her. I brought him up the stairs. I can remember shivering with the little dawn sea wind blowing through my cotton nightdress from the open window. I made him tea while he sat in the window staring up at the grey clouds of the morning. At last he said, You must book yourself a room at one of the hotels in Oban only for a couple of nights. I'll come back probably tomorrow or the next day. You see, and he began to explain carefully, politely, as if to a foreigner. You see, I've got to find Catherine, and so I have to go down unexpectedly to London. From our remote part of the Highlands there are only two trains a day. Alan went on the early morning one. I had, of course, no intention of going to any hotel. I knew where my promise to Catherine lay, where lay my love, I said, yes, yes, to everything Alan said and stayed in the cottage all that day. And then I caught the evening train. There was no chance of a sleeper 
I huddled in the corner of a carriage packed with returning holidaymakers, my face turned first to the twilight and then to the darkness rushing past the window. In the dead, cold hours, when the other passengers sprawled and snored, the terror for Alan nearly throttled me. Once I dozed off and woke, biting back a scream because I thought I saw the telephone wire running alongside the train, stretched and singing, You'll never know. You'll never know. Euston in the morning loomed gaunt and monstrous. The London streets were dripping with autumn rain. I told the taxi man to drive as fast as possible up to Hampstead. When he pulled up in Allen's Road before a gate set in a high wall, I was already half out of the taxi. I pushed the fare at him, slapped open the gate and ran up the short drive. I just had time to notice that the white Regency house was more or less what I had pictured before I was up the flight of steps and tugging at the iron bell pull. I was tired, deadly tired, deadly afraid. What courage I had ever had seemed to have fled. I promise, I promise, oh, if you've ever really been here, please have gone. I gabbled while the London rain poured over me and the bell reverberated through the house. At last I heard a movement inside the house and then footsteps slowly drawing towards the door. For a second, Alan and I stood gazing at each other. Then, suddenly, I was over the threshold and in his arms. While the door swung gently to behind us, I drew him over to the staircase, drew him down, knelt beside him as he sat there on the second stair. He turned his face against my shoulder and heaved a sigh. After a little while, I raised my head and looked about me. We were in a large, white-panelled hall with a window through which I could see a plane tree, its quiet branches stroking the glass. The only thing in common with our hall up in Scotland was the telephone, standing on a mahogany table against the wall. For some moments I gazed at it. My terror was wholly gone, like a dream at morning but I became aware of a new emotion, disquieting, faintly discreditable. I looked suspiciously down at Alan. I wanted to know. Cautiously, I began to frame my question. He was so still that I wondered if he had fallen asleep, but just then he stirred, and I took his head between my hands, and as he smiled at me, turned his face searchingly towards the light. It was calm, as though washed by tidal waters. I knew that I could never ask my question. At that moment the front door bell began to peal. We both jumped and got to our feet. You go, said Alan, disappearing into the back of the house. The sharp-nosed young man in the dripping Macintosh was aggrieved. Been sent to cut you off, he said. Bill unpaid. Nothing done. I turned back into the hall. About me, above me, the house lay quiet. Only against the window the boughs of the plane tree clamoured in a sudden flurry of wind and rain. The question I could never ask, the answer never to be given. Surely both were irrelevant. For all the tranquillity of the house, I felt my panic begin again to stir. There was only one thing that mattered to me, to us. Alan, I called, and I tried not to let my voice quaver. It's about the telephone. Do you... do you want it cut off? I held my breath. The reply came immediately. Why, darling, we're going back to Scotland tonight, out of this damnable climate. We don't want to pay for what we're not going to need any more. Tell them they can disconnect it at once. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come, come back, Mother? What's the secret? So that was the telephone by Mary Treadgold. 
And now we come to the part of the podcast where I discuss the story and I say something about the author and say something about the story and my uh, response to it. If you are just wanting stories and no commentary, then you'll find on YouTube I have some extensive playlists and compilations either in the Sleep Stories playlist, playlist or the uh, full audiobook playlist. And there are many hours of stories chained together there that you don't have to uh, listen to any commentaries if that's your particular bag. If you are interested in the commentary, and apparently some people are, um, let us go on. So, The Telephone by Mary Treadgold was first published in 1955 as part of the anthology The Third Ghost Book, edi uh, edited by Lady Cynthia Asquith. So there are a whole bunch of these um, ghost books, and they're really quite rare now. Or oh, they're more expensive than they were, and I've got one or two, and they're kind of battered old 70s, well, these are not even 70s, 50s paperbacks, and they went on for a bit. So this story was later included in Roald Dahl's book of ghost stories, 1983, which has remained in print ever since. You may know it's my project to work through that book. There's a couple of reasons for that. The main reason is that um, I nearly have. And then I, once, I've, once I've read all the stories, I'll be able to get rid of it and make a little tiny bit more space in order so I can buy a new book. I've got tons of anthologies of ghost stories. And of course, many of the stories are repeated, but of course, no anthology is exactly the same. So I'm working my way through the anthologies that I've made the biggest dent in to see if I can clear a bit of space. Roald Dahl famously, um, and I said this when I did this, I uh, did the uh, In the Tube, was it? By E.F. Benson. And I said that he had decided to approach somebody to make a TV series of ghost stories and nothing but ghost stories. And he began in the 50s to read ghost stories and he collected hundreds of them and read hundreds of them and was astonished to find that most of them were rubbish in his opinion. So I think he ended up with um, 24 for the series. And this uh, anthology, Roald Dahl's Book of Ghost Stories, came out in 1983, as I've just said, has the best of them. Now, I think I have... Now... It's very interesting. I like this story, The Telephone by Mary Treadgold. I've just told you what it was. You just heard it. But I went on to Goodreads. Now, Goodreads is notoriously harsh. So you can find, you know, Hemingway or anybody who thinks any good or Edith Wharton or William Shakespeare or Charles Dickens or, you know, John Cheever or anybody, any, Neil Gaiman, anybody. I'm going to go through a list of all the authors that ever existed now. And they will have 3.5 stars out of 5 because somebody won't like them. And they will write very caustic reviews in many cases. So if you are a self-published author, as I was, then it, you find that they say, I think my books ended up as um, between 4.3 and 4.5. Some were 3 point something. But um, that wasn't bad really but they, they you know they're awful on goodreads they're very amazon reviews tended to be kinder but something about the people who go on goodreads i think they and i've said this before they think they're they think they're critics and they think the role of the critic is to um excoriate an author uh, they don't think that they uh, partly a role of the critic is to be helpful they i don't know they've got this persona or there is a persona of the critic that um, is an embittered person who just wants to pull authors down. And what they say is, of course, the critics are failed authors. Um, that's what they say. I don't know. They say a lot of th They say a lot of things, and we shouldn't always believe what they say. But in this case, I think they're probably right. Um, I, I say this before. The Stereophonics have a song called Mr. Writer, and it's a part of Kelly Jones um, had a critic, a music critic in this case pull apart his stories and he wrote this song about the critic um, which isn't very kind in his wishes to the critic but the critic deserved it in my opinion and I've got on to critics point was Roald Dahl thought this was a good story Goodreads don't think it's a good story I think it's a good story I'm with Roald Dahl and I, what I was saying is I've come to kind of understand Roald Dahl's taste and the whole point of me beginning to talk about Goodreads was to say that, you know, some people like different things. Honestly, 
some, I know people who will say, ah, oh, Shakespeare's a lot of rubbish. Okay. And you, you, so you are a, you are a what? Well, I'm a joiner. Right. Okay. But I think he's rubbish. And uh, I think um, Crossroads, that is not anymore, is, is a work of literature. Well, it's all about your taste, isn't it? Some people like some things, some people don't like other things. And I've come to the conclusion that actually there was this idea i was reading this article about the canon and there's a guy called levis who set out and said what is good literature and the idea was there are two views on this one is it's like i said it's just your taste and the other was there's an objective standard of good literature there is something that makes literature great and i think this still floats around in the world of people in the world let's just say and i actually think but then, but I think that some writers are better than others. How, why do I think that? Do I say that's just my taste? Well, when I'm in a good mood, I say, yeah, it's just my taste. And, you know, I may think, uh, looking at the shelf, Ray Bradbury, looking at his shelf there, he's a great writer. And you, and I've, honestly, I've done Ray Bradbury stories. I did The Crowd and I've done Witch Door. I've done various. And somebody will comment, yeah, that was rubbish, you know. So I make my point. Is it taste? Uh, but some of me is saying, like Roald Dahl, yeah, no, some of this is better than others. So what is Roald Dahl like? Roald Dahl likes a bit of character development. When we get our pulp stories, I was reading um, an article which referen referenced Aristotle's poetics. So Aristotle was uh, this Greek dude way back, man. And he, um, he had a lot of influence, a massive amount of influ influence on our civilization, uh, on Western civilization. When I say our, I mean mine and some of the other people listening. And it, so he had a massive influence and he said, basically, mythos is plot. Plot is what drives a story number one. And he says character comes second. Now, what we had in the 19th century and 20th century and early 20th century, really, early mid, was um, character is king. So when you look at uh, the novels that the great and the good in their drinking clubs in Soho, I don't think they drink. I think they eat, have lattes and um, macchiatos in cafes in Soho and uh, go to the theatre. And I, I think that they uh, love character. So to me, you can, I think there are some great novels that are just about somebody having feelings and feelings are great like if you if you can be bothered with that kind of thing i personally think feelings are overrated um they just get you in trouble it's for, any feelings i've ever had have always caused me trouble you think about it anger pride any of those things let's not well love and its corollary and its sequelae um yeah, so they just get you in trouble. So me, feelings, no. But I appreciate that people in Soho and that kind of class of people, they like books about feelings. Roald Dahl, he likes a plot, but he likes feelings as well. I don't mind character when it's funny. Um, I, I've just been reading a fair bit of Agatha Christie recently and think she's really funny. And I may change my mind on Jane Austen. I remember having to read Jane Austen when I was doing English literature at school and finding it dreadfully dull. We did Emma. But I think uh, I was a you know, teenage boy at the time and I was not disposed to, in a very working class community, and I was not disposed to thinking it was good. But now I think I probably would enjoy it a lot more. So I, I quite like a bit character with wit. Anyway, we've wandered a long way from Mary Treadgold, but maybe not as far as you think because... This story is about feelings. Rold likes that. And when I come, and after all I said about feelings, I come to this story and think, oh, yeah, it was good. Why was it good, Tony? I ask myself. Oh, well, there's two things. I'll tell you what I like. I'll tell you what I like about it. I like the settings. So I would love a house in Hampstead, like his house. And I would really like to stay the summer, but not the winter, in the West Highlands in a lovely cottage with a massive beach. All, all summer. 
as long as the weather's glorious, unlike this year, unlike last year, unlike the year before. No, the year before wasn't too bad, but I think we get a nice summer every five years or so. And it isn't this year. So, yeah, I like the setting. I, I, I really like the ghost over the telephone. There's something about ghosts over telephones that I really, really, really like. Or ghosts communicating. So I like that. That's just a kind of spooky, chilly, ooh thing. And I also like the exploration of love. That's a feeling. I know. I've just contradicted myself. But I do that all the time. So why should this be any different? So this man had an affair with a much younger woman. And they loved each other. There's no doubt about that. So he, he had a very companionable long-standing relationship with, uh, with a woman who he didn't have children with, but even so. And they were together and they were, did a lot of work and they were very, happy, you know, for many, many, many years. And he meets this much younger woman and there's no fool like an old fool. But let's not, you know, there is no suggestion that their love of the young woman and the older dude, that there's anything other than lovey about it, that it's pure love, it's true love. And we know that true love is the most wonderful thing in the world because we heard it in The Princess Bride. Okay, fair enough. But there's guilt, isn't there? There's guilt. And the fact that you have both of those things at the same time, it would have been easy, it would have been cheap, in fact, to kind of besmirch one and just make guilt and make the true love, make her a silly little tart or him a vacuous, empty-headed, lustful old goat. And then we could, and the guilt would, then we, ah, yeah, right. It's one dimensional in that case. But because it's served up to us with the love being actually pretty pure and the guilt being pretty pure as well. And because of that, what they say is um, when you're writing a story, always give your character a choice between two bad things. Not a good thing and a bad thing, because then they're just going to choose the good thing. That's, that's easy. So what you need to do is one thing and another thing that are both bad and they have to choose the least worst, the least worst. And that makes for a good story. Whereas if it's just like uh, the choices between staying in a burning, burning building or leaving a burning, burning building, a burning building even, then that's not much of a choice. But if you make it like, you know, who are you going to rescue? Your ex-wife or your, or your girlfriend? Well, in this case, the ex-wife's dead. So I thought that was really, I liked that. I thought that was really nice. Let me tell you something about Mary Treadgold, because I've just skipped over her. She was born in 1910 and died in 2005, so she was a good age. She um, wrote both children's and adults book, and she was literary editor and, BB, uh, and a BBC producer. She was born in Muswell Hill, North London, the daughter of a stockbroker, and enjoyed a comfortable upbringing. She was uh, educated at the Gin and Mower, or Gin and Moor, probably it's not, Mao is how I'd say it, but I'm a northerner, so, so, but I'm sure posh people say, Jenna Moore, the Jenna Moore School of Dance and Drama, Challenge School, St. Paul's Girls School. No, I knew a girl who went to St. Paul's Girls School. She was a girlfriend of a friend of mine, and she was lovely. And Bedford College, London, where she had an MA in English Literature. After university, she worked in publishing, becoming Heinemann's first children's editor before joining the BBC 1940. She spent 20 years at the BBC, forming lasting friendships with figures like George Orwell and Una Marson, and then became a full-time writer. The telephone, as I said, was in 1955. I, I'm drawn to um, compare the story with The Pomegranate Seed by Edith Wharton. I don't know if you know The Pomegranate Seed. In The Pomegranate Seed, there is no adultery. I think the, the wife dies and the younger woman comes along. But then he starts getting letters, not telephone calls, but letters. It's a spooky from um, his, his dead wife, his late wife. And he becomes incredibly preoccupied with her. Now, the difference in this is in the telephone, our man, our aged um, Lothario, he manages to have a happy ending because he manages to overcome the pull of the dead, his guilt. And he manages to move forward and they start an idyllic life together in a cottage in Scotland. It might last, I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so, but uh, not without weather. But um, maybe if they got a dog, the dog would cement them together. Maybe they could have children. 
but he'd be a very old father. These are the things you think of. See, I treat them as if they're real people. That shows how good she is. Whereas in the, in the pomegranate seed, it doesn't end so well. No spoilers. Go and listen to it. I've done it, of course. My, my method here is, in the madness, is to direct you to other stories that I've done and keep you within my web. That's evil. That sounds evil. Um, okay. So, and then the other one we have to think about is The Snow by Hugh Walpole. So The Snow is another case where the wife has died and the man is married to a younger woman. And, but in this case, the dead wife haunt, I can't give you any spoilers, but it's nasty. So this idea of, and remember these are written, Hugh Walpole's a man, he was a gay man. Um, uh, what was uh, uh, Edith Wharton was a woman and um, and a straight woman as far as I know and um, old uh, Mary Treadgold I, bel- I don't know about her I don't know about that so I'm, I'm now on ice now thin ice but um, you know she was certainly a woman so it's not about, it's about, I think she's probably straight, but it's not about looking at the relationship from a, 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 a man's point of view or a woman's point of view. But they all treat it differently. But this, this idea of the man and the younger woman and the ghost of the wife is a recurrent theme and different writers treat it differently. Now, the other thing that struck me, it struck me, I'd done a story called Three Miles Up by Elizabeth Jane Howard, who was 13 years younger than Mary Treadgold. But from a similar kind of social and geographical setting. So they may have known each other, I don't know. It's quite possible that they knew each other. But um, what I want to say is that in in that story, no spoilers, a, a woman appears and is treated by the men as a kind of, it's sort of anticipated that she will do the cooking and cleaning. And um, it struck me in this story, the, the telephone, it, almost unquestioned by the author, how the young woman, partner, lover, switches between being a lover and between being a carer or a, in a maternal role. And it struck me how in many relationships, traditional relationships, the wife, is also takes on some of the role of the mother, so she's looking after him, making, taking care of his health, and presumably cooking and cleaning for him as well. And that this is, I'm not making a feminine point, a feminist point. I'm not a feminist. I'm a, a man. How can I be? So, um, but what I'm saying is, it, it, it struck me that this is her. This is what she's doing here. Um, that she is um, becomes his mother almost unthinkingly. She just becomes the mother. And that struck me as being um, of its time, certainly. So that's it, really. All I want to say is I like the story. I thought it was good. It had to do with feelings. It had to do with guilt and relationships. And this, um, and, and in a sense, I suppose, is it the fact that the wife is dead in all three cases that I've talked about, the pomegranate seed, this one, the telephone, and the snow, does that give her some power? Or in fact, are we just talking about in general terms about how people negotiate the guilt of leaving a, uh, an established relationship? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. That's probably all I've got to say. Please stick around if you want to hear some more. I've got lots and lots of hours of stories for you too. Uh, Think about becoming a patron if you want them without ads at www.patreon.com forward slash Barkid, B-A-R-C-U-D. And I've got all the members, I've got all the stories there, which um, you can download. And we do a members only story every month. Now, people have said, oh, you can get them all for free. That isn't true. That isn't true. Not by me, you can't. And you can't. That's just a fact. Uh, You can maybe be able to find a version of somebody else doing it, but not by me anyway. Okay, I would love to see you on Patreon. If you can't do that, that's fine too. Hope you're all well. More stories to come. I just remembered something. I was going to tell you a story from my um, working life. Now, it went a bit like this. 
many, many years ago, possibly about 16, 17 years ago. So the people involved are now dead. So I feel, and I'm not going to identify them anyway. What it was, it was an old couple. And um, they'd been together for 50, 60 years. And they were in their 60s and 70s, late 60s, 70s, I think they were. And then one particular night, it, it occurred to her that she wasn't really married to him at all and never had been. So what she did was, they were sitting, they had a coal fire. She took her wedding ring off and threw it in the um, fire in amongst the coals. This is a true story. And he was really dismayed. Now I should say something about him. They were, they were a meek couple. They weren't, they were, when I saw them, he was a very gentle, retiring, defeated by life man, you know, or defeated by this particular thing. He'd loved this woman all these years. I even want to say that they were childhood sweethearts and they'd been together all the years and brought children up together. And now they were retired and approaching the end of their lives. And suddenly she decides not only does she not love him, she's never loved him and she's not even married to him. And so remember, I was a psychiatric nurse and she was in fact became psychotic and this belief was delusional. And she then believed that who she was married to was the owner of a coach company. So, um, you know, Sharabangs where they organize trips off and this is what his company did. And they'd go off to Blackpool and they'd go off to Edinburgh and they'd go off to London or somewhere on a coach trip. And I think she'd been on a coach trip and it occurred to her that this was her real husband, not the man she lived with. So she started basically going around this fella's house, the coach driver, the coach owner, and presenting herself as his wife. You know, of course we're married. Why do you say we're not married? And he, the coach owner was, um, coach firm owner was understandably uh, disturbed by this and unnerved, as was his wife and his family. So she ended up being uh, detained under the Mental Health Act um, because she had no insight that there was anything wrong with her. And so um, she wouldn't accept treatment. And so you can argue about the ethics of this. I used to do this for a living, you know, argue about the ethics of it. But that she was detained, and that means she was committed to a hospital, a psychiatric hospital, and not free to leave. And the, her husband would come in, and he was so upset, and he was a lovely old man, and he was so upset. Uh, and she was adamant she was not married to him, and he was not her husband. So let me tell you this. So I, w I was given the job of um, escorting her to the public phone. She wanted to go and make a phone call. She was free to make a phone call. So this psychiatric unit was in a general hospital. It was a psychiatric ward attached to a general hospital. So we would go and I would be her escort uh, because she was not free to leave. And we would go to the, the bank of pay phones that they had in those days. And I remember her ringing this number and I'm standing and not, not so I didn't need to hear, but I was, it was hard for me not to. So I was standing relatively close and she, I saw that she, pre, she pretended to ring a number, but she had a finger on it. And then she did this pretend talk. She was ringing the coach owner, her husband, but she did this awful susurrating talk. So it was like, sis, 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 sis. She's talking to this nobody, but who knows what she thought she was doing. But there was just something about that talking, this insane conversation. And I don't mean insane in the sense it was full of nonsense. Just because it was that whispering noise, there was something really unnerving about it. And I actually got frightened and I you know over the years have spent a lot of time with people who were psychotic and I've never really been never been frightened like that I've been frightened sometimes they might try and kill me but um I've never um and then, then never did I've been with people who were who who told me to my face that they wanted to kill somebody I've even been with somebody on night shift who told me he was thinking of killing somebody it could be that doctor outside or it could be me and I thought well Anyway, we gave him some uh, Valium and he was fine. But, um, but this particular woman, and then when she'd finished the call, which wasn't a real call, and she hadn't actually rung a number. So what was the level of her delusion? In any case, we went back and that was the end of it. But there was just something about that 
whispering and this look on her face when she was doing it, like a, a smile, but not a nice smile, like a, I want to say an evil smile. And I realize I'm putting my feelings, I'm projecting my feelings onto this poor, sick woman. Um, she never, ever, she became less mad, but she never, ever accepted that she was married to that man again, which was really very sad for them. Anyway, there's a bit of truth for you. But there's something about that, and I think maybe that's why this idea of the conversation on the phone freaks me out. But uh, there we are. Okay, that's life. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the story. Hope you didn't mind the anecdote too much. Um, speak to you soon. Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?